In this video essay, we're going to be discussing multiple topics, German Expressionism, Pure Cinema, Italian Neorealism, and Citizen Kane. Let's get right into this German Expressionism. This was a film movement in the 1920s that originated, uh, guess where? And I'm here with my co-host, uh, Count Orlock, otherwise known as Nosferatu, and we're going to go through some ways you can tell if a film is German Expressionism. One, the sets look like uh, they, they look like this they look cool they look good and that is because they had set builders who normally built sets for the theater build movie sets this along with the use of lighting and shadow makes all these films feel very atmospheric and moody two films at this time were still silent i mean sure some movies had music playing in the background but dialogue wasn't really a thing yet so in a German Expressionism film, the characters will express their thoughts and feelings physically because how else are they going to do it? So this, of course, means that the actors need to be more expressive. Oh, is that why they call it that? Three, the film is spooky. I mean, that's not like a, it, it doesn't have to be. That's not a guarantee, but uh, most, most of them are. And with those three points in mind, let's check out an example, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I'm just kidding. I'm gonna talk about Nosferatu, but that's that's only because I'm being forced to. I think the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is better. Nosferatu is about a guy having a sleepover at this dude's house. And this dude is a vampire. And with a face like this, I mean, I knew something was up with this guy. It is a little hard to take Nosferatu seriously because of that one time he showed up in a SpongeBob episode. Then who was flickering the lights? <laughs> Nosferatu! What a weird thing for a kid's show. Anyways, looking back at the points of what makes a German Expressionism film a German Expressionism film, Nosferatu flies that test with flying colors. Sets and lighting. Both are used incredibly effectively to give off this eerie presence. I mean, you know right off the bat that something is wrong with Orlock, because look at how he's presented to us. Continued with lighting is the use of shadow. This shot could have just been him walking up the stairs, but showing his shadow is so much more effective in adding suspense and mystery and just overall tone. Do you have anything to, to add? You're a terrible co-host. Next, the physicality of the performances are able to elevate the characters to the next level. This dude is a clueless goofball and Orlock is a mischievous monster with a haunting on-screen presence. Lastly, this was the first gothic horror film, so it's pretty spooky. I think Orlock's design still holds up. I mean, it's still disturbing to look at. So essentially, German Expressionism elevates the visual aspects of film to create an overall sense of tone and atmosphere that otherwise wouldn't be possible with words. And there you have it. That was German Expressionism uh, with me and my, my co-host Nosferatu. And listen, I mean, if you're going to stick around, like, can we just like put a towel on your face or or something because I'm I'm getting really sick of looking at you. Pure cinema. I told Nosferatu that there was a blood drive going on outside and he fell for it. Anyway, here's a clip of Alfred Hitchcock in an interview talking about pure cinema. What one might call pure cinematics, the assembly of of film and how it can be changed to create a different idea. Now we have a close up let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child. But leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. It's very simple. The order of shots create a meaning, and changing the shot, or the order of the shot, changes the meaning. This also means that you don't have to show the old man looking at the lady with both of them in frame. You just need shots of both the subjects, and the meaning is created. You could have the old man look at anything. Look, now he's looking at a, at a nice, juicy cheeseburger. And look, now he's, now he's staring at a picture of me. What? what? Thank you so much, Mr. Hitchcock. I'm, I'm honored. 
Here's a scene from one of his films, 39 Steps, which I think illustrates pure cinema. To preface this whole situation, this guy is being falsely accused of murder and is on the run. This guy agreed to let him sleep over at his place. And this is this guy's wife. They sit down for dinner and the farmer starts to say his little prayer. He mentions sins, which makes our protagonist really reflect. It then cuts to the wife noticing this and then looking down at the table cut to the newspaper talking about the murders that he's framed for, very similar to Hitchcock's example from the interview of having a character look at something, then cutting to what they see. It then cuts back to the wife's reaction of shock. The order of the shots tells us that she looked down, saw the paper, and realized what's going on. It then cuts to the protagonist's reaction to her realization. Also notice that the wife isn't centered in frame like the two gentlemen are, because she does all this looking around, which comes off better at this angle versus if it was more straight on. It also makes her seem more casual and relaxed compared to them. This whole interaction is a silent conversation between these characters and due to the pure cinema element of ordering the shots in a way that creates a meaning that pushes the story forward without saying words. And that's pretty much what pure cinema is all about. All right, enough of the old man. Let's talk about Italians. Imagine this, World War II. All right, that's, that's terrible, that's not fun at all. Let's stop, stop imagining that. Imagine this, World War II just ended. Italians, they're completely over fascism, okay? They're not a fan. An Italian film, okay, stop putting a picture of spaghetti behind me every time I say the word Italians. Italian filmmakers are being trained by French filmmakers who are currently making poetic realism films and the Italians start to get ideas of their own. White telephone films were lighthearted comedies that flooded the Italian film market, but there was just one problem with them. They weren't relatable to the common person living in Italy post-World War II. So great filmmakers like Cesar Zavattini and Roberto Rossellini started making neorealism films. Films where the whole point was relatability, with characters and themes that embodied what the country was like at the time. Poverty, unemployment, child labor, government corruption. Along with those depressing themes was the overall look of the film being very down to earth. Let's look at the film The Bicycle Thief. Scenes are shot on location with whatever light is available, with long takes and tracking shots. Nobody in this film is some badass movie star, you know, just a lot of regular looking people. The story acts as a slice of life and doesn't have a very conclusive ending because, like life, the story is continuing. Neorealism is all about finding the beauty in the little moments of everyday life. The Bicycle Thief is a simple story about a father and son trying to find the father's stolen bicycle. And it very much succeeds in showing how this one simple, small-scale situation can be dramatized in a way that is interesting and fun to watch. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for, the film that has been touted as the greatest, because it is, Citizen Kane. So I'm going to go through these five elements and break down why this is a landmark film. Montage editing and just editing in general. There are some literal montages. First, I think you could consider the newsreel at the start one. It acts as a summary of Kane's entire life and also what the general public think of him in just a few minutes. And if this wasn't in the movie, it would make the movie way more confusing. Since the movie bounces around a bunch, you kind of need this summary at the start so you already have a good idea. And then there's the two wife montages. They both have the same effect of showing how the relationship between Kane and his wife slowly fall apart over the years when they're together. His first wife is shown to us over and over again at the breakfast table and their short conversations becoming more and more antagonistic. And his second wife is shown doing puzzles over and over again as Kane continues to practically ignore her. Both of these montages are incredibly effective of again showing us how their relationships fell apart and doing that in a very short amount of time. But in the rest of the movie, a lot of the scenes honestly have very little cutting. A lot of the scenes are just characters talking to each other and the camera just sort of lingers around them. So when it does cut to a close up of someone, it really emphasizes their reaction. The scenes that do have a lot of cuts are the ones with a lot of emotional tension, good or bad. A good example is when Kane meets his second wife for the first time and they're chatting in her apartment. Another example is a scene when his first wife is learning about his affair with this woman. These scenes have a typical amount of cuts in terms of modern standards, you know, with lots of reaction shots and overall coverage. But then you get scenes like this, which is all in one take. This particular scene revolves around Mr. Kane's financial troubles and obviously the other two focused on his love life. 
You could make the argument that a scene like this doesn't need a whole lot of coverage, but that doesn't automatically mean it needs literally zero alternate shots. It was a conscious decision by the filmmakers to have these more emotionally dramatic scenes be covered more and have more cuts as a result because the cuts help make them more dramatic. But it only feels like that because so many of the scenes don't have them. Sound. Music is mainly used in scene transitions to establish a tone. There's very little times that music is put behind dialogue. Besides music, looking at just the general sound of the film, let's go to this scene when Kane is watching his wife sing at the opera house. We see Kane, who isn't clapping, while we hear the loud clapping from the audience around him, which slowly dies down, so Kane himself stands up to clap. We don't need to see the audience lose interest because we can hear it, so we understand why Kane has put it upon himself to keep the clapping going. Sound overall is pretty naturalistic. There's a few scenes where it gets really loud. There's this bird jump scare near the end, which establishes the tone and chaos of what's about to happen in the scene. This scene has the dramatic clicking of the typewriter as Kane fires his only friend, which I think adds to the casual yet pissed off mood that Kane is in. Lighting. We're sticking with this scene at the Opera House to illustrate this film's biggest lighting technique, shadow. When Kane stands up, his face gets covered in shadow. This happens a lot. Characters go in and out of shadow constantly. My favorite example of this is near the beginning when Kane is signing this promise in his newspaper to give nothing but good old honest news and to be a voice for the people which is a total lie. And during this entire moment, his face is covered in shadow while the other characters in the scene are perfectly lit. The importance of this is that he's lying whether he wants to admit it or not. And if we go back to the clapping scene, he's also lying to himself in a way because he knows that she isn't really that talented, but like his business partner said, he's always trying to prove something. That doesn't mean that every shadow implies lying or being malicious because there's characters like the reporter guy who is mainly shown in shadow, but I think that's because he's a character that we're not really supposed to care about. Like he's really just there to be a catalyst of information. He's not that important to the actual story. But in terms of Kane, I can confidently say that the constant shadow usage has to do with the constant conflict of his character. He is a complicated man. He's not purely good or evil, so he's neither purely lit or dark. He's constantly fluctuating, which is why he's constantly coming in and out of light and dark. Cinematography. A lot of the shots in any given scene are composed in a way so that all the characters in the scene are visible. And if there's one character who starts saying something of great importance, the camera will push in on them. Or if the characters are moving around a certain space, the camera will follow them. This makes us, the audience, feel like we're spectating these people because the camera just keeps on rolling. It's actually crazy impressive for these actors. Think of a lot of modern movies. You know, they have so many cuts that the actors only really need to nail one line at a time. But these guys had to remember and film whole entire conversations in one take while the camera wanders around them. That is crazy. There is also some amazing blocking being used. Back to this scene from earlier, it starts off with Kane's manager completely alone in the frame. Then it's revealed that Mr. Thatcher is also there. And then it's revealed that Kane himself is also there. It almost feels like they're using blocking in order to keep the shot interesting without having to cut. This scene could have been filmed a million different ways, but I think this is the most visually interesting way to do it. Honestly, I could analyze any shot with Kane in it to show you how perfectly this film visually tells us things. When he's firing Leland, he's the biggest thing in frame, showing his power while Leland is behind him and is small. In this scene, Kane appears to be the smallest in frame, but he's also directly in the middle while every other character is looking down at him, showing that he is the center of attention. Here he is, also small in frame, while the people around him are bickering and arguing about him, but he's concealed himself in shadow, showing that he's ashamed of the whole situation since this is when his wife figures out about his affair and he knows he's going to lose his election as mayor. Along with the cinematography is the use of deep space. A lot of the sets and locations that these characters are in have these big open spaces behind them. Characters often walk through these deep spaces, which implies a mental distancing from whatever they are physically moving away from. For example, the scene where his second wife divorces him, we see her walk down this long hallway. I also think the deep space in a lot of these scenes helps us focus on the characters because they are visually the most interesting thing in frame since behind them is open nothingness. Final thoughts. 
First, I want to bring this around full circle and point out the qualities of this film to the other three points from earlier. In terms of German expressionism influence, I think the use of shadow to physically show us characters' feelings or true intentions is a clear example. Pure cinema, I'm going to go back to the opera house scene where we get shots of Kane's wife, then the audience's reaction, then Kane's reaction. The order of the shots tell us that Kane is attentive while the audience is literally falling asleep, and we understand that Kane is noticing both things happening. Neorealism. First off, the actors in this film were practically nobodies before this, and while the ending isn't completely open-ended, it's definitely up for interpretation. We are never told exactly why Rosebud was his last words. You are meant to create a reason as to why you think it was his last words. The film gives reasons as to why they could have been, and it gives you the context of what Rosebud meant to him, but the actual reason as to why he said those words and why he was thinking about it at that time is completely up to you to decide. In the end, Citizen Kane continues to be a gripping masterpiece start to finish. This was the first time I've ever seen this film, and now that I've seen it, it, it has just taken over my life. I seriously can't stop watching it and thinking about it. It just has this stranglehold on me right now. I want to end this essay by playing my favorite quote of the entire film. That's why I used this scene so many times as an example. I just, I love it so much. You know, Mr. Bernstein, if I hadn't been very rich, I might have been a really great man. Don't you think you are? I think I did pretty well under the circumstances. What would you like to have been? Everything you hate.